This has to be one of the wonders of the world. Today it's hard to get folks to a prayer meeting. We were out here this morning looking for God. The promise of God is if you seek him early, you'll be found of him. Amen. You just, you know, I learned a long time ago that world out there, they stay drunk, they go to bed, hung over, they don't get up very early. Amen. A lot left interference of the devil early in the morning. It's so good to have you here. We've got a testimony going to share with you. Um, um, before we get in, we'll not have any music in these 7 o'clock services. We'll have this service, then you, you go to breakfast, get back here at 10 o'clock, and we'll begin the second one. But in this service this morning, we're going to have a testimony here. I believe Dan's ready over there for you. Just let's, let's hear from him. This is let you know what's happening uh, around this world. International director with the School of Christ International in the Caribbean and parts of South America. In August of 2005, we started the first school in Trinidad, and in two and a half years, we've expanded from there into seven other countries. It's amazing how God began to move throughout the Caribbean islands. We took students from Barbados, St. Vincent, Curacao, Aruba. We reached down into South America, into British Guiana, Suriname. French Guyana. Since that time, we're running schools in the Amerindian Indians in the nation of Suriname. We're running schools in the Dutch-speaking people in the nation of Suriname. Also in French Guyana, we're dealing with the Amerindian Indians, the French-speaking people, and this year coming, we'll be dealing with the Portuguese-speaking pastors from the Assemblies of God, the Amerindian Indians, down into the northern parts of Brazil. What a time we've seen God move in this school in such a short time. In two and a half years, we've graduated nine schools from Trinidad, six schools from South America, and nearly 300 students. And revivals come to that part of the world. As we're here today, the school is getting ready to be translated in two more languages, into the Ceremonese language and the Dutch also. We just know that now is the time to reach these nations. The field is white. The harvest is ready. And we believe that God is, is doing a great work out of this little nation. From that place this year coming, we're going into the nation of Martinique, another French colony, ready to set schools up there. Recently, we've been invited to Iceland for the first time. And w what a trip that turned out to be. I met with a man there by the name of Eric Erickson. Uh, what a wonderful brother he was. He, nine years ago, has started a TV studio, the only TV studio in the nation of Iceland. He started out very small, built up over nine years. Now he is in the European Broadcast Network. He's broadcasting in the 55 nations, over 400 million viewers every week. And, and God just opened such a wonderful door for us to meet this man of God. And as we met with him, I, I arrived there at 6.30 one morning, 1 o'clock that same day. I got to meet Brother Erickson. And I sat down and began to tell him about this school and what we desired to do to come into that nation. I didn't know much about Iceland at the time, and I'd sit and spoke with him, but quickly began to find out 97% of that nation belongs to the state Lutheran church. Ahab and Jezebel runs that church. They pay the pastors, tell them what to preach. They take up no offerings, no tithes. It, the people have no say about anything in that nation. One percent of that nation claim to be Christians. No one knows how much of that is Pentecostal or charismatic. But a very small percentage there of structured churches to see anywhere. Most people meet in houses. Brother Eric has people meeting in a TV studio as he preaches on TV. People come, 30, 40 people in the studio at a time. This is what they call church. And as I began to sit and share with him the vision of this school of Christ, he began to weep. People began to rejoice and weep, and he began to tell me. In 1937, there was a prophecy by a man named Adam Rutherford. He was a pyramidologist studying the pyramids in Egypt. He was a believer, and he believed that the pyramids held a specific place in Scripture in the Word of God. 
And he began to study and he began to look and he said Iceland was going to have a key role in the end time. He gave two prophecies over that nation. In 1937, he said in 1941, Iceland will have its own independence. It was a, a, a colony of Denmark at the time, total impossible for them to have their, their liberty and their independence. They considered it an occupation. But when Hitler invaded Europe and reached over into Denmark, their independence did come in 1941. The first prophecy was fulfilled. The second prophecy, the man of God said, in the last days, this nation, this nation of fire, this nation in the sea, he began to quote the scripture out of Isaiah chapter 24, when it said in the midst of God's judgment, in the midst of those last days, there would be a people out of the seas that lived among the fires that would affect and glorify God and reach their generation. He began to quote that scripture, believe that, and he prophesied in the last days out of this nation that a light would come and go into many nations and then go into the world. And as I sit and spoke with them about this school, they began to weep. They said, this is that prophecy being fulfilled. And immediately we went into broadcast from that moment. Four days we spent on TV. Four hours we spent preaching the gospel sharing the school of Christ to over 400 million people across those oceans into Greenland, Norway, Finland, Sweden, all across Europe, down into the northern parts of Africa, preaching into Tripoli, in the Vatican City herself. The broadcast is there. As I spoke with Brother Eric, he said, this has to be the prophecy. He said, two years ago, God spoke to me to buy a school and to start up a school in this nation. He bought a facility, 38 acres, three houses, a huge schoolhouse, gymnasium, cafeterias, showers, everything on one piece of property. But for two years, he struggled to keep that piece of land. Didn't know how to pay for it. Many times, he wanted to cut it up make apartments out of it, rent it out to try to hold on to the property. But God wouldn't let him. For two years, God tested his faith. And when we came, he said, now we know this is the will of God, that the school can come to this nation, that we can reach our nation, we can reach the world with this broadcast, with this school, with this nation. We can affect the world with the gospel. And as we sit there, he began to show me that prophecy. He said, 1937, this man began to speak. And he said, you've come that this can be fulfilled. And I believe this is true. I believe God has raised us for such a time as this. The possibility of reaching over 400 million people from one small island an island of fire, volcanoes everywhere, lava underneath it flowing, geysers everywhere, ice on the top, but God is sending a fire in this school, a light to reach a world. Amen. And you that give to this school, make it possible. God's raised us up for such a time as this that we can reach this nation. The school of Christ is the tool that's bringing revival in this last day. Thanks to your giving, you can be a part of this end time harvest of God and fulfill the prophecy of the great man of God. God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. When the school starts, he says he's going to put us on that television every day with that school, reaching all across. Possibility, at least the audience the potential audience of 450 million people. Isn't that, it, yeah, that has to be the hand of God. So many things that this has worked. You know, when we went into Russia in, in 1992, began our first school there in October, October the, or, yes, October the 1st. I told those students, every one of them that come through that school about uh, the prophecy of the great, uh, Chinese, uh, Hudson Taylor, the great Chinese missionary, uh, how that God, while he was in England, put him into a trance before a great audience, and for several minutes he was there. Then when he come out, he said, God took me to Russia and said, I saw a great movement begin there that spread rapidly across the earth, and then Jesus came. That, that was the prophecy and what it gave him. 
Well, every school, I said to those students, I said, we, we're, we're here, I want to be here when that happened. But I've discovered we was what happened. This school is what he saw in 1870. Sure as you sit in this building, it was this school that he saw. We come to realize that as it spread. This year, our, our students around the world have become such missionaries. We have my great friend over here and those with him, Brother Jacob. We moved into Azerbaijan, just trained a whole school of, of born of, of, of Muslims. Now they're set out. The school is there. We'd had one student out of Azerbaijan the whole time that we were there. It's a totally Muslim world, but now that school. But they're, they're moving now up to Algeria. They're working on getting in there with the school, and others are taking it. We're finding we're in places we never dreamed we were because it's a time. It's a time for that. It's a time to reach our world, to touch this earth. We're so thrilled to have you here this morning. I, I'll be making the announcements more at 10, but we have a school starting on, that'll be Monday, it's coming Monday week in Goldsboro, North Carolina. I'll be there for three weeks teaching this school there in Goldsboro, North Carolina, if you're in that area, uh, we, we, we'd like you to know that. We're going, we're going to be there for three weeks and expecting a wonderful time, wonderful facilities there. Uh, Brother Kirby and his dear wife, pastors there, they're, they're sponsoring this and others around there. We were up there and met with some leaders just a while back, but we'll be there That'll be for three weeks, beginning the 31st. Then June the 2nd, we begin the school right here. Now, since we were here last year, the church here, in their mission to us, have given the School of Christ. They, at the time when Rita come through here, that was a much worse hurricane than hit Louisiana. That's the fourth worst one ever to hit this nation. <clears throat> but New Orleans got all the attention. It left this place in total ruins almost, but they had replacement insurance. It tore the roof off the uh, studio, ruined all of the television. I bought that in the 80s, and at the time it was the best you could have. But you couldn't have sold it for $30,000. Everything moved to the digital, but they had replacement insurance. It cost them $1 million to put it all back in there. We have the television studios coming down to see what's going on now. Here, well, they one Sunday, the mission offering, uh, he took it, it wind up somewhere right around $100,000 that morning, and now we have in here the streamers, everything that anywhere in the world. Uh, so what's going to happen, we're going to test it out in June when Brother Aubrey gets back over there. He'll teach at school in the morning, I'll teach in the evening. There's five hours difference in the time, but I'll be live there from right in here, while I teach it here, we'll be able to bring it down in Iceland, and I'll, I'll be teaching at school there in the afternoons with him. That's the possibilities of our time. Worldwide, God is reaching for a world. Hallelujah. I want to bring the message to you this morning. I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. My message, obedience, the essence of faith. Obedience, the essence of faith. Father, thank you all oh, for this wonderful time, the prayer meeting this morning, to be able to come here and be in your presence, talk to you and you talk to us. Bless today the reading, the preaching, the hearing of the Word of God and help us not to be foolish virgins that hear and do not put into practice. You said that man, that woman that hears what you have to say and does not do is foolish. Foolishness cost them their place in that bridal company. God help us in this building not to be so foolish. In the name of Jesus, amen. Reading from Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. What a, what a prayer, what a statement 
of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Apostle Peter made it very plain that he and he alone is our example. He said, as my Father sent me, he so send I you. We don't have to sit around with committees trying to work out some kind of a program. We are to totally assume the ministry of Christ. That is the reason for our being. He left the example just as Elisha was called not to begin a new work, but to assume the ministry of Elijah and carry that ministry further. He had twice as many miracles. He carried that ministry on the, the same identical ministry. When Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also in greater works because I go to my Father, didn't mean that we were going to have a greater quality of miracles, but a greater quantity because Christ could now live in us, his church, and not be limited to Jerusalem or, or, or the Sea of Galilee, but everywhere. He multiplied himself through us. We are to be on this earth what he was. The Bible said, as he is, so are we. That just simply means we, the church, the body of Christ, have one purpose on this earth, to be a revealer of Christ. That's our purpose. This is a call. Now, God's command to his church is, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That put the awesome responsibility upon us. But that responsibility simply is fulfilled in our obedience in doing what God's called us to do. He never asked us to do anything but what he would not do through us if we become available. He never asked us to get a Hagar and produce something. He just asked us to go where he calls, do what we're told, leave the responsibility of the doing and the power up to him. Now, God's command, we are almost there, folks. I can tell you, we're almost there in the, all the world with this wonderful gospel of Christ. You look across this map, now those green tags up there. I believe they put them up there as to where we're not. But about 30 of them, I understand, now have to come down because we have got there since we last were here with the school. We've arrived. We're almost there. Christ said, this gospel will be preached in all of the world. Then shall the end come. Now, the end is not the rapture of the church. The end is on down the road. But this gospel is going to be preached. Not, not the gospel that's being preached for the most part around this world, but the gospel of the kingdom. Paul said in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 19, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, I have fully preached this gospel unto you. That gospel, this Pentecostal gospel, the Great Commission was given in a Pentecostal context and can only be carried out by a Pentecostal church in Pentecostal power. Now, I didn't write the book. Jesus said, don't you go until you receive this. It was given in that, and that's the way it must go. As we go full of the Holy Spirit, it just simply means that Christ is there. It is by the Holy Spirit that Christ is able to live within us and do the work of God. The school of Christ in the last month has made disciples, planted churches, and brought a great move of God in now understand about 30 new countries since we were here the last time. I just was checking last night with the different ones that have got here. The end is in sight. We can finish the course if we'll just not become weary in well-doing. If we're willing to stay the course, pay the price, the cost that it's going to take, then we can do, we can finish this course and see and meet our God. I can tell you, we're going to meet Christ in a little while, and he's going to say one of two things to us. Why? There is no excuse for us not making it. I give you power. It's the word of God. Behold, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Well, that power, he said in Acts 1 and 8, was you shall receive this power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. We see that. It came in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. 
They challenged the Roman Empire. And the only generation that reached their generation for Christ because they went in His name full of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I want to encourage you this morning. We are almost there. I pray that this message will encourage us to press on, believe on, because the end is in sight. The Bible said, A body thou didst prepare me. Now that expresses the claim of God. Christ walked this earth in a body like this one. But at Calvary, he laid that body down. And at the day of Pentecost, we become his body. A hundred and twenty people was the beginning. But now Christ lives in us. What that Old Testament tabernacle was, what Solomon's temple was, what Christ was as a man we have become. We're the holy of holies. If this world sees God, that world must see God in you and I. This is the responsibility that has become ours. Today, this is where he said, A body thou hast prepared me. That means God has prepared it. That expresses the claim of God. And the text says, I come to do thy will, O God, expresses our surrender to that claim. That's all that he wants out of it. If you give, we'll go. If both of the giver and the goer will do their part, Christ will do the work. There's nothing can stop us from reaching a generation for Christ if we're willing to be and to do all that God has told us to will and to do. In the doing the will of God, we have the destiny of the creature. If we just could know this one thing, in doing the will of God, the blessedness of heaven and the greatest secret of redemption, that's what it's all about. Our being birthed of God, fulfilling the purpose of why that we were birthed. Now, in this consists the worth of Christ's sacrifice, and this alone is why the blood prevails. Listen, the path Christ opened up to God is the path we must walk in if we're to enter into that holiest of all. There's no other pathway in there. Doesn't make any difference what you claim. This is the path. It is through God's will that we enter into God himself. Nothing. God has nothing to do with the people that refuse his will. There's no place in this kingdom for you, for me. It is only the pathway of the will of God that we find the entrance into God himself. As I live, walk, be what God has commanded me to be, then I have every right to expect God to do the work through me. I've said it over and over, but Moses never went to Egypt with a plan. He just simply went there to do what he was told. That's all God is asking out of us this morning. If we'll give ourselves to this purpose, understanding that the only thing required of me is to do the will of God. What a wonderful thought. You know, the central thing that Jesus gives us when he gives us himself is a heart in which the will of God lives. When he, what he gave me with himself, he said, I come to do thy will, O God. I have no other purpose on this earth. He never one time deviated from that purpose. The whole temptation of that wilderness was an attempt to get him to act independent of that father. He said, if you be the son of God, command these stones to become bread. If he could have got him to act independent of that father, he would have smote him like he did the first Adam. But he refused. He understood that he's only here for one thing, to do the will of that father. I speak no words of my own. I do nothing. I do not see my father sue. I have no will, no glory of my own. I come to do the will of the father. And if we live that way, we will fulfill the purpose of God. Nothing can keep us from that. Absolutely nothing. I've read that statement of the great preacher Paul over and over. He said, I finished the course. 
There's no way you can study that. What he was saying was, I've healed every sick person I'm supposed to heal, planted every church I'm supposed to plant, cast out every devil I was called to cast out. I've saved every soul I was called to save. I have finished the course, and I'm going home. Up to, hallelujah. I've finished the course. I've done everything required of me in this world. Up to that time, there'd been a fear in his heart. You know when the nephew come and said, there's 40 people out there that have shaved their head, said they're not going to eat or sleep until you're a dead man. He said, you go tell the chief captain what's going on here. And when he left, the angel said, don't fear. Don't fear. God doesn't speak. God doesn't speak words without meaning. If there hadn't been a fear of dying, then there never would have been an angel told him not to fear. Never would have. But when he finished that course, all of that is gone. I come to this city 51 years ago. Hadn't been here but a few months. Preacher here, 86 years old. That seemed awful old then. Seemed not so old today as it did then. Amen. But, but I, I, that looked like it's going to die. Went over, called everybody to pray. I never saw such fear in my life on a human being. They've been saved for 70 years. I've been preachers of this gospel for 60-something years. Now they're about to meet this God, and they never saw such fear on a human being. I left there very, very confused about matters. I, I'm very new in all of this. I went to my house. I got that bedroom, and I said to God, I'm going nowhere till you tell me why that that person after all these years is so frightened. Here he is about to meet you. He's preached you, and now he's so frightened. I thought I might be in there an hour or two, but five minutes I'm out. He said to me, I'll tell you what the fear is. They haven't done what I told them. They're going to meet me. They haven't done what I told them to do. It's a fearful thing, ladies and gentlemen, to leave this earth and meet that God. There's absolutely no excuse for you and I not fulfilling the purpose and the promise of the Almighty God. That's all he asks of you. Now, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He humbled himself, become obedient. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. And that's a gift of God to a man or woman full of God is a heart that desires one thing, to do the will of God. Paul said, this one thing I do. He was a focused man. He wasn't here to do anything but the will of God. Wherever that led him, he was going to go. This is God's message to us this morning. If he can find such people in this convention, then we will not fail to fulfill a purpose. Now, because God is a perfect fountain of life and goodness, there, there can be no life or goodness but in the will of God. None. I don't care how religious we are. I said last night, discipleship has become one hour in church on a Sunday morning. Not, not what discipleship is all about. Discipleship is that everything I have, own, and am belongs to him, and it must be available to him every moment of every day. There can be no questions to God about what God wants out of your life. That, that's not tolerable in this kingdom of God. The evil ruin of sin is that man turned from God's will to his own. Adam wanted his own will. That was the evil of that time. He wanted his own will, and so he become his own God. That's the way it works every time. That's happened in, the, in this modern church. I've watched it in 55 years as a preacher of this great gospel. I've watched a church completely turn unto itself. We've created a parasite of the pew that goes to the church to get and not to give. The whole effort of it all. What's in it for me? I've had them come to the front door and ask the usher, are the gifts working here? Well, they will work. Whatever God wants will be here. But they were running around looking for something to satisfy their own little self-life. When that turned into the being, everything was lost. But when everything rested on this, I come to do thy will, O oh God. If you want my money, you can have my money. If you want my life, you can have my life. I have one purpose upon this planet that's to fulfill the purpose of God and hear him say to me, well done, 
thou good, thou faithful servant. Oh, that God, I believe in this audience today that there are people that are ready to give themselves everything to this Christ. The redemption of Christ had no reason, no object, no possibility of success except in restoring that man to the will of God. That's all. Restore that man, that is the human race, to the will of God. Adam sold us all down the river, every one of us. Listen, it was for this that Jesus died. He gave up his own will, his life, rather than to do his own will. I come to do thy will, O God. He gave his life. He died. Everything that that might be so. If you truly wish to know Christ, listen to me. If you truly want to know Christ, and that's all that matters, because the measure of our success is the measure of Christ that we bring. Not how clever we are, not how much money we raise, but the measure of Christ that we bring. And the Apostle Peter let us know very clearly that everything that pertains to life and godliness is in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. To know Him through life is the answer to everything. And if you truly want to know Him in the power of His resurrection, hear this word. God never pours Himself through half-hearted saints. Never. He has no time for laziness. People that don't have time to pray. He that's not a praying man is not a Christian man. I don't care what you say, how you put it. There's a downplay of prayer today all over this world. They're making light of prayer. But every man, every woman that ever affected his world for God was a praying man. He spent a lot of times in the presence of God. The greatest human ever walked this earth, God become a man. And every time I met him, he was either going to or coming from a prayer meeting. And the Bible said he ever lives to pray for me right now. Yet you have silly people making light a prayer. I come to do thy will. All the Old Testament types and New Testament reality teaches this great truth that I'm saying this morning. Every man or woman of God to touch their generation had to pass through their own Gethsemane. They had to come to that place of crushing. That's, that's, that, that's two words, Geth and Gethsemane. One, the place of crushing. Had to go through that place of crushing. Every one of them. That two words, geth, a simony. Geth, simony. That's the same word. Simony, the seed, the whole thing. There has to be a crushing before that which is of God can be brought out. And every man, every woman had to pass through that. We died to every other will but the will of God. Every man, every person that ever been truly used of God had to come to that place. All of this, all of this thought of ourselves, and all had to come to Calvary, had to die there before God could ever do His will. So obedience then is the very essence of faith. If you don't do what you're told, you don't believe what you were told. It doesn't matter what you profess, what you say. I preached in holiness churches. They wouldn't give a quarter to see a world saved, but yet they've got them dressed up. They all look like they come out of the same ribbon. You know, it's like the hippies, nonconformists, but every one of them looked the same, smelled the same, never bathed, or nothing else. But they're supposed to be some kind of nonconformist. I've watched the same thing take place spiritually. I said, I've, I've watched it. Obedience is the essence of faith. If you're not doing what you know to do, you don't believe nothing, and there's nothing holy about your life. Your holiness is a facade unless you are living what you know to be the will of God for your life at this time, then there's absolutely nothing to what you call faith. Now, faith is always the power by which a man gives himself up to an unseen object and receives it into his heart and being. Abraham, get up, get out. He don't know where he's going, but he got up and got out. That's where faith always. 
It's always in the unseen. Once I have it, then it's not a matter of faith now. I receive the Holy Ghost by faith, but I receive something. I see people, I'm taking it by faith. Well, when are you going to get it? Amen. You can't have God come into your life and not know that he's there. When he filled me, I knew he filled me. It's not a faith now. It's a matter of something happened to me. I was born again one night. I went in that church one thing. I come out another. I went in going straight to hell. I come out going to heaven. It all happened. It happened. It happened. It happened. I didn't have to call somebody and say, you think I'm saved? Or do you think I'm filled with the Holy Ghost? I knew God had done a work within me. But faith always leads a man to that unseen. And if he's not willing to walk there, he'll never know the scene in his life. He'll never come to know it unless he's willing to walk out of what he cannot see until he's willing to walk there. Now listen, it's impossible to receive God without receiving the will of God. I, I've I pastored long enough here. I have men said, well, God's called me to preach. Now, I'm going to preach just as soon as the kids get out of school. Well, when they got out of that school, they had to go through another school. I said to them, you're not never going anywhere. You're going nowhere. Amen. Well, I've got to take care of my family. I said, if you don't believe God can do that, you better stay where you are. Just keep selling your shoes, whatever else you're doing. But this thing, this thing demands that I give myself. It's impossible to receive God without receiving the will of God. Therefore, to have God's best, obedience must be the one thing our heart is set upon. I want to hear what you're saying, and I want to do what you're saying. If that's not so, folks, you're walking in the wrong direction. Do you, you hear me? You, you, you go through a man's Bible. He marks what he wants in that Bible. I can take your Bible home with me and tell you where you are. I've seen the Bibles, they marked it, oh, that thou mayest prosper and be in health. That's all they ever marked. I can tell you, you go through there and you see a man marked that I might know him. Oh, my God. Oh, yes, sir. Let a man mark that in his Bible. You come through. He'll double underline that. You've got a man seeking after God, and whatever God wants out of that life, he can have out of that life. Amen. To obey means to give earnest attention to the Word, to submit to its authority, carry out its instruction. That's what obedience means. Carry out those instructions. Otherwise, you know a true heart is a man sitting in this building this morning that come here for one thing, to hear what God had to say and to put it into practice in his life. Now, that, that's not true of everybody in this room. Some come because they, they want to be seen. They want to meet other people. They want to get a revival meeting somewhere. Some of them come because they like the music. That's not an honest heart. All that other is just to lead up to something. I come here this morning. God's got something to say. My God, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. Not only just hear it, I want to put it in practice in my life. Oh, I love this music. I love this piano player. I do love this organ. I love these singers. I love the music. Oh, I love that 200-voice choir up there in that Times Square church, I can tell you. But I want to tell you something, folks. I've learned in my lifetime that's a privilege, not a necessity. I've preached this gospel all over this world without a tuning fork or anything else. Amen. Just stand up, preach this gospel. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to God. It always leads to that. I was invited to preach at that time. They're all dead now. One of the greatest singing groups is supposed to be uh, of all time. Maybe, I don't know, but they were re really great. I went to their church to preach. I'm going to be there Monday through Friday. I'd been in the hotel all day praying with there that night. House is packed. Oh, it's full. They, and they got up and announced the singer's not going to be here tonight. A one-third of them got up and left. One-third got up and left. Just when they heard the singers weren't going to be there, they got up and left. Well, the music was kind. They stayed. One of them stayed and led the singing. Then they all left. Now I thought, well, they, they, they probably got something they got to do. But I preached the next night, repeated the same thing, went through the same thing. No singers. That didn't bother me any. But they lead that singing, then they left. But that third night, when he got through, I'm standing right behind him. And when he turned around, he scared him. He didn't know I was there. 
And I'm standing right there. I said, I want to tell you something, sir. If you don't want to hear me preach, I don't want to hear you sing. You understand? Don't you bother to come here. I don't need you to jack me up. I come from that hotel ready to preach this gospel. Yes, sir. I was talking to God before I ever got here. Hallelujah. He is God. It's impossible to receive God without receiving that will. Obedience in this sense is almost dead in modern Christianity. What I'm telling you, it's almost dead. Listen, non-obedience has paralyzed millions and millions of Christians, rendered them incapable of standing un uprightly, and are absolutely unfit for the bride. They cannot. Just simply because they hear and they don't do. That's what cost them five foolish virgins. Foolishness means, Jesus said, he that hears what I have to say and refuses to do it is foolish. Now, Jesus said it. Then he called them virgins foolish. They heard, but they didn't do. And when the trumpet blew, they're still here while the others went. It is those people that know and do the will of God. That's the people that believe God and unbelief robs a man of it all. Amen. Believe in everything, but obey in nothing. The modern church is shocked at the very mention at the word obey. You all, you want to run them off. You just begin to preach this until it becomes a moral conviction. A man told me, he said, you know, only about 20% of my church tithe. This years ago, I said, well, 95% of them tithe where I am. How do you do that? I said, preach it till it's a moral conviction. You preach it once a year, they're not going to do nothing. Amen. You've got to deal with it. Preach. Obedience. This is what God says. Until it becomes a moral conviction, then men stand up. Men will stand up and do or else they'll leave. Sometimes we need a revival of subtraction. Some of those people in there are nothing but a hindrance to what's going on. All you're doing is spending good money on making tares comfortable. But if we can rid them, we can take the money they're given and reach a world without God. <laughs> Obedience may be taught now and then in the modern church, but it's not stress until it becomes a power over those that hear it. Do you know this is what God expects of me? You know, my father, he, he pretty well expected it out of me. One time in my life, he told me to do something, and I asked him why. I never repeated that again. No, no. No, no, he never, he never gave no explanation. He just put his finger on my nose and said, because I told you. That's all. You understand? Yes, sir. I, to I understand. Need no explanation. No more. Never ask that question again. Brother Chambly loaded rocks, big part of his life, just because that's what he needed to do. He didn't know what it was all about. But I've laughed him many a time. <laughs> Amen. But he, he taught him something. Taught him something. Amen. For, 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 faith, for this to become effective, a doctrine must not be received, uh, must not only rather be received and held by the church, but must have behind it the pressure of a moral conviction. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is the will of God. This is the thing that's me. A faith that does not manifest itself in obedience to the known will of God, it's not the faith of God. You're playing games with the Almighty. Now, the New Testament there's no contradiction between faith and works. None whatsoever. Faith and obedience are none. You know, Paul testified that he was sent to preach obedience to the faith among all nations. That's in Romans 16 and 26. Now, the message of the cross contains two elements, promises and declarations. Declarations to be believed, commandments to be obeyed. That's, that's, that's the truth of it all. Obviously, faith is necessary for the first and obedience for the second. And unless the second is a reality in your life, you never believed it. You just said you believed it. Unless I do what he told me, then I do not believe what he's telling me to do. Now, the first essential of surrender is a deep humility that has but one desire. That's to trust and obey God. You know, we used to sing a song, Trust and Obey. But that's out of date now. You know, we don't. We don't, we don't sing those kind of songs no more because they, it might offend somebody, offend somebody. Has the cross lost its offense, folks? What are we? Where are we? 
Listen, obviously faith is necessary uh, for the first, obedience to the second. Therefore, say to God, any cause, in any way, you're ready to obey. You have become, if that's from your heart, you have become an instrument that God could use beyond your dreams. I deal in the school with young people, a big part of them coming. Amen. I say to them, there's no limitation of the life except a life that limits God. And the way you limit God is that just so far you'll go and no further. But if you give him yourself, there is no limitation. You know, I grew up in this world, uh, this, this country. Poor folks called us poor. I, you know, we, we, we lived so far back in the woods, had to pipe sunlight into that place. You know, we just, there was nothing, nothing. Amen. But I, I've learned this. If I wish I'd have known what I'm telling you now, when I begun to preach this gospel, I wish I knew all of this then, amen, that God expects nothing out of me but just do what he says. Just when he speaks, you do. I'll do the work. I got Abraham in the middle of Genesis. God told him at 75 years old, you and Sarah are going to have a baby. Well, all those years went by, no baby came. Now the improbable comes impossible. I mean, she looks like she's practicing to be a prune of some kind. She's 100 years old. Her womb is dead. There's no possibility of no baby. Now the whole earth is shaking beneath him. And God come to him, how is El Shaddai? You know what he was saying to him? I'm the life giver. I'm the nourisher. What he said to Abraham, I never asked you once to produce this miracle. All I want you to do, son, is you believe it. You just keep telling folks along the line. Amen. You just keep referring to Sarah as fruitful womb. Just That's her name, fruitful womb. Doesn't matter what the world says about it. And you just keep introducing yourself as the father of many nations. You don't need a Hagar. You just need to believe me. I do the miracles. I'm not asking you to work one at all. You do what I tell you. Hallelujah. I was under pressure, unbelievable here. The work had become just, just, the pressure was for, for money. Not that we weren't receiving, but I was looking down the road. It's going to take us two years to get where we are now, this time last year. It's going to take us two years at the rate we're going. I've got men all over, all over the world. I've got them, you heard the testimony here. We're in Ethiopia. We're all over the world. They're, they're seeing the possibility. It's now. It's ripe. I knew that so. We went to Russia. We could not do there now what we did when we went at that time. Impossible, though we're still there, but we can never do what we've done now. I knew the time is now. The door is open. They're telling me we can go there, but I didn't have the money. I didn't have the money. It's coming. It's going to take time. Well, in that, all of that, God just reminded me what I already knew. He sent a wonderful man, his wife down here, want to talk to me. And they come down. First of all, we sat down in that office, and he said, I just want to tell you. God told me, he said, I'm almost, I almost feel out of place to tell you this, but God told me to tell you, you tell you that he's your only source. Don't look nowhere else. Don't try nothing else. Well, I knew that. But under that pressure, I've got a lot of thoughts being given to me. And it's so easy to say, how do you know them people not hearing from God? But when he said that to me, I just broke down. I just knew because I knew what God was telling me. You just hold steady. I'm still in charge of things. Then he handed me an envelope and when I opened it up, it was $1,100,000. Church of a hundred people. I said, the church of a hundred people. What are you saying? I'm just saying he's just telling me. Not only sent the man down there to tell me, but said, you just do what I tell you. That door's open. Walk through that door. Don't ask no question why. Just walk through that door. Don't be foolish. Don't be presumptuous. Wait on me. Hear what I've got to say. Move with me. Then it's my responsibility. But if you won't go, I cannot do nothing. I'm a spirit. I have to have a body. That's what God has said. Therefore, say to God that God will never disappoint the trust of a soul fully committed to him and his will. Final thing or lasting thing. When a man speaks what he knows to be his last word, he'd be very careful what he says. When a, when a man, you, I, I knew 
this is the last thing I'll ever get to say to a human. Then I'm very, very, very careful. Christ's last words to his church before he sent it was, Go you therefore and teach all nations. Find words. Don't you know he weighed those words? These are the last words. You go, teach all nations. That means make disciples in all nations. With that one word in his heart, he sat down on the throne expecting that through you and I, his church, every human on this earth would hear the gospel. Totally without excuse. Listen, totally without excuse. He believed that. The word that proceeded was the key. That word was, you shall receive power. When he sent them forth to conquer a world, he instructed them not to think of their own lack of power. See, don't you go out thinking, I, I don't have the ability to do this. No, no, that's not what you to do. I'm going to give you power. His word to them was, and to us is, in Matthew 28, 18, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, it was given to him as the man, Christ Jesus. Nobody has to give God anything, folks. It was given to him as a man, Christ Jesus. Now, that, that means it's to the church. He's the firstborn among us. That's what the Bible says. So that all power, and then the second, listen to it, 28 and 20, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. From that point on, from that moment on, it was to be the Holy Ghost who would work in and through us to carry out that commission we are without excuse. We're absolutely, there'll be nothing you can say to him. I would have liked to have done it, but I never had. He said, you telling me that I couldn't have done it if you'd have let me. You're not, you're not thinking of yourself. You're thinking, he says there's no, in that moment, no excuse for failure. I know in John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39, the last day of that feast, Jesus is there, and he says to him, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And John said, this he said of the Holy Ghost. But he said the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. I believe that's the key myself to interpret it. Theologians have wrestled with that. Some said John must have been dis, uh, deceived on that matter, must have been mistaken rather, because it was given. It was on the Old Testament prophets. It was here. And we know John the Baptist was filled from his mother's womb. All of these kind of an argument. Well, we settled that argument saying it never received it like we received it. That's only a partial answer, though. It said it wasn't given because he wasn't glorified. Once he set down as the first creature, the firstborn of a new race, set down at the right hand of the Father, glorified that he's exactly where we're going to be. He's exactly if we stand because what God, all of God's working on this planet is produce a corporate man in the exact image of that personal man that's up there now. And so when he sat down, he waded through, tempted in every point I am, faced every devil I'll ever face, saw everything that I'm ever going to encounter, yet he made it through how? By this Holy Ghost. He said, I'm giving you the same power that brought me to this throne glorified, and there's no excuse for you. That serene is imperative that every believer be filled with the Holy Ghost. If we, the children of God, will give and go, millions will be saved. If we rebel, those same millions will perish. They will perish. The Word of God emphatically declares, if you and I, who make up the church, will absolutely consent to obey His last command, the whole world will hear this gospel. Multiplied millions of souls depend upon our obedience to the faith. You are saved because somebody told you. Somebody brought this faith to you. There's millions around this world. Millions of souls wait on that obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandment. That, that's, there's no mistake. That's a command of God. If you love me. Now, some must go. Others must sin. The goers and the sinners will simply will, if we'll simply will to do the will of God, Nothing can stop the fulfilling of this commission. Nothing if we'll just will to do that will of God. That's all God asks of us. I will do the work if you will will to be partners with me. If you will be the vessel through which I can work through 
He said, all the gold, all the silver is mine, but it's in your pocket. You, you're the one. It has to come through you. I'm not going to come dig it up. You're the one. Going to have to, if you will sin, we will go. And by working together, we'll finish the task, and we will hear him say, well done. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. The essence of faith is obedience. You believe nothing till you obey. You know, we talk. We talk, but we don't do. Talk of great faith, but do nothing. The world pretty soon can see through that. I'm sure God saw through it from the beginning. Just just don't. There's no, no, no faith required to do nothing. But to believe God requires that I walk out where I don't know where I'm going. But I've learned something in these years. The greatest thing about living by faith is a man may not know where he's going, but he always knows where he is. Yes, sir. I know tonight, this morning, I'm in the will of God. I don't know where this path may lead further, but I know at this moment in time, I'm in the will of God. Just stand with me a moment. Lift your hand. Let's worship God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Bless, break it right on down. Yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, my, come on, folks. Let's surrender to God. David said, let the lifting up of my hand be as the evening sacrifice. That's the word of God to us this morning. Let my prayer be as incense, Lord. Oh, I love you. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. For this moment of history, my God, did you let me live in this day? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, my God, oh, my God, my 